excited that you're here, and I hope you've got your Bible with you. I encourage you to turn to the Gospel of John. We'll start there in just a few moments. We'll be spending our time in the writings of John, both the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also the book of Revelation. I want us to do a word study tonight. Word studies are always interesting. A word study is interesting because the words are vehicles of thoughts. That's what words are. And words transport thoughts from one mind to another, and because of that, that makes word studies quite interesting. Here's what's involved in a word study. Take a word that is found, and we may look at the English word and what it means, but then we might go a little bit deeper and look at what the Hebrew or the Greek, as the case may be, whether it's in the Old or New Testament, what that word may mean. And we see how it's used in the context. It may mean something different in this context than it does maybe in another context. And here's what that word study will do for us. What it does for us is it brings out the riches sometimes of the text that we may not see on the surface. But once I find this word and I see what this word means, both in English and in the original, then that brings out part of the riches of the text. I see deeper understanding and deeper meaning. Quite often it may solve interpretation problems. That is, here's something that seems like a contradiction. It may be an alleged contradiction between this passage and another, but a word study may eliminate that by my understanding. Now, this word doesn't mean what we thought it meant. And we put it back in its context, and now the text makes complete sense. And so now we have a richer understanding of the text when we do a word study. I want us tonight to begin looking at words that describe Jesus. We're going to find some words that are found in the Gospel of John. These are writing in the, and the writings of John, not just the Gospel, but the writings of John, which we've already mentioned includes John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. These words will define who Jesus is. They will tell us also what he does, and it will help us enrich our faith in our Savior. So I have a better understanding of who he is. I'll have a better understanding of the work that he does when I look at some of these words. So let's, let's begin. In John 1 and verse 1, he is called the Word. We're going to look at several texts, not just John 1 and verse 1, but Jesus is referred to as the Word. So let's begin by looking at the passages that refer to him as the Word. So if you have your Bible, look at John chapter 1 and in verse 1. In John 1 and verse 1, the text says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here Jesus is referred to as the Word. Drop down to verse 14 of the same text. In verse 14, the text says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he again is referred to as the Word. Well, let's go to 1 John. Again, we're looking at the writings of John. And John is the only one that uses this expression to refer to Jesus. And in John 1, 1 John 1 and in verse 1, the text says, That which we have from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon with our hands, and we've handled concerning the Word of of life. Now while you're in 1 John, turn on over to the 5th chapter and in verse 7, verse 7 has a perhaps a gloss, we won't go into the gloss at this moment, so your translation may miss part of this, don't get excited about that, but verse 7 says, for there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now that may be missing from your translation, and if it is, your translation is based on the minority text. Now let's look at another passage in the writings of John, Revelation chapter 19, and in verse 13. So it is mentioned in one of the epistles of John, this great essay of John called the book of Revelation, and found also in the Gospel of John. But chapter 19 and in verse 13, we see that he was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now let's understand what that means. That word, word, comes from this word, logos. 
What does logos mean? Well, Vine says it means the expression of thought, thus fulfilling the significance of the title Logos. The word, the personal manifestation, not of a part of the divine nature, but of the whole deity. So we have Vine, and we're going to see another definition in a moment, but get what Vine is saying. Vine is saying that the word is the same concept as we talk about a word that we may utter. It is an expression of thought. So Jesus is the word. He's the word of life. He's the word of God. Not the word in the sense he is the word, but he is the expression of thought. He's God's expression of thought. M.R. Vincent says it's the inward thought that is expressed as well as the outward form in which it is expressed. So Jesus is that inward form that is expressed. He is the expression of God. So what's the point of Jesus being called the Logos? Well, he is the expression or the manifestation of God. So if we take what's in the mind of God and we have the expression of God, we see other passages that deal with that concept in a moment, Jesus is that expression of God. Seth Wilson perhaps said it best. He said that the, the word of a man is the most important expression of his character. The Christ is the supreme expression of God's character. And we'll finish that, but get that picture. That Jesus is the express image, or he is the expression, the supreme expression of God's character. He was much more than mere action of God. He was and is a person, but in the whole personality and life, he was the perfect expression of what God is and does. So if I want to know what God is and does, here is the expression of that found in Jesus Christ. We're still talking about the point. What's the point being made? We know the essence of a person by his words. So I know you and what you are by the words that you utter. I know God and what he is and what he does and his character by Jesus because he is the expression of God himself. Jesus is the speaking of God. He is the communication of God to man. Look at John chapter 14. Let's go back to this gospel now of John. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 8. This is in the context of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, earlier in the context. But verse 8 says, Philip says, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Now notice verse 9, Jesus said, have you been with me so long and you've not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? In other words, I've already shown you the Father. Now verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he uh, dwells in me, does the works. So what I just learned from that is that he is the communication of God to man. So you want to see the Father, Philip? Then you've seen the Father when you've seen me. Not that I am the Father, but I am the expression of the Father. In other words, I am the Logos. Now let's look at some related passages that may give us some insight. Let's go back to John chapter 1 now. We're trying to grasp what it means that Jesus is the Logos. So John chapter 1 and in verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. That is, no one has seen the Father at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. In other words, words not used there. It's used in verse 1, verse 14. But the Father has, uh, or that Jesus declares the Father to us. He is the expression of the Father. Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And perhaps one of these passages may ring a bell more than one of the others. That's why we compound some of the passages. They all say the, essentially the same, but maybe there's an expression in one that rings a bell. And you say, now I understand. Look at chapter 4 and in verse 6. For it is God who commends light to shine in darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, how do I understand the light of God? I'll understand it in the face of Christ. So Christ, again, is the manifestation of the Father. Let's notice one more, and then we'll look at the context of some of these passages. Notice in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 15. Colossians 1 and in verse 15. This is talking of the preeminence of Christ. And in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the exact representation of the Father. He is the firstborn of creation. 
Well, that's a very similar concept, not the exact same concept, but those passages are related passages that drive at the very point he is the expression of God the Father. Now, the context in which these passages set tell us something about the Word. For example, let's go back to John chapter 1. What do I learn about him being the Logos? Well, in John 1 and in verse 1, I learned that he was coexistent with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he was there in the beginning, and he was with the Father. So he's coexistent with the Father. He didn't come into existence after the Father. He's coexistent with the Father. Before Abraham was, I am, John 8 and verse 58. All right, so what I'm learning, he's coexistent with the Father, and I learned that from the context of this word logos. Let's go back to John 1 and verse 1. Not only was he coexistent with the Father, but he's equal to the Father in that he's deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's deity. John 1 and in verse 1. Now John 1 and verse 14, deity became flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That Word that was deity, that was coexistent with the Father, was made flesh. So Jesus of Nazareth who was in the flesh, was the deity that was there in the beginning with God. So Jesus is said to be the Logos. But here's another term that describes Jesus. And that is, he is the propitiation. It's not a term we use every day. We don't normally, in just conversation, I want to tell you about my Jesus, and I want to tell you how he is my propitiation. And they would probably ask, what on earth did you just say? What does that mean? Well, what does it mean that Jesus is the propitiation? Well, let's first of all establish passages that say he is the propitiation. Let's turn over to 1 John. And notice in 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 2. He says, and he himself is the propitiation. Let's back up and get verse 1. He said, I write unto you that you might not sin. In other words, I'm writing telling you not to commit sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. What does that mean? We'll come to that in a moment. While you're in 1 John, turn to chapter 4 and in verse 10. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Same concept, same word. He is the propitiation for our sins. Well, let's look at another passage. Now, this is not in the writing of John, but it is a passage that uses propitiation. This term is not peculiar to John. So let's go to Romans chapter 3 and in verse 25. God set him forth, speaking of Christ, to be the propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate the righteousness because of his forbearance God had overpassed or passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now, there's a lot found in verse 25. All I want us to see is that he is the propitiation by his blood. So there are three passages. Those are not the only three. Hebrews talks about this as well. But these three passages tell us he is the propitiation for our sins. Now, here that word propitiation comes from this word halismos. What on earth does that mean? Well, Vaughn says that word means merciful, perpetuous. It signifies an expiation. It means whereby, a means where, whereby sin is covered and remitted. In other words, it's a sacrifice. But it's more than that. And we'll see more what that more is in just a moment. But notice the connection with this word merciful. You'll see more about that here in just a moment. In other words, it's, it's an ex, uh, expiation and a means whereby sin is taken care of an appeasement, in other words, that appeases the wrath of God. Now that word is used in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the, where the Hebrew text of the Old Testament was translated into Greek. And when that took place, it is the word mercy seat, this word is used, that is translated propitiation. It's the same word for mercy seat. In fact, it's akin to Hebrews 9 and in verse 5. You might just jump over to Hebrews chapter 10, 9 and in verse 5. The word propitiation is not used there, but I want you to notice in verse 5 that an above was the cherubim, the glory overshadowing the mercy seat, talking about the ark, and there was the cherubim over the mercy seat. This is where man met with God in the Old Testament. 
Well, that term mercy seat is very much akin to this word that is translated propitiation. Very closely connected with that. In fact, in Luke chapter 18 and in verse 13, you remember where the, the, sin, uh, the, uh, the publican prayed, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the passage we're talking about. God be merciful to me. That's the very same word that is translated mercy seat in Hebrews 2 and in verse 17. God be merciful. Here's the mercy seat. Again, here is where God blesses man with mercy. It's where man indeed meets with God. Now let's talk about what that means. I know what the word means, but let's talk what that means to us. Thayer says what this word means is it gives the idea of to appease the wrath of God. So more than just a sacrifice, it is a means of appeasing the wrath of God. So if Jesus is the perpetuation for our sins, it has inherent in that the idea of God's wrath has been stirred. And something needs to appease the wrath of God. And so Jesus is that which appeases the wrath of God. The word mercy comes to play in that it means to show mercy to the sinner by covering or removing the sin. So when the sin is removed, there is an appeasement to the wrath of God. That's the idea of him being the propitiation. In other words, when Jesus died, a payment was made, an atonement was made for our sin. It's the idea of there being an appeasement. Now here's some lessons that I learned from this use of the word propitiation. Let's go to Romans chapter 1 and in verse 18. When I look at this positive concept that Jesus is the propitiation, I have to grapple with a negative concept, and that is that sin stirs the wrath of God. Quite often, let's footnote here to say, some, quite often people have a concept, we want to hear the positive things. I don't want to hear the negative thing. You cannot hear that Jesus is the propitiation on the one side without understanding that sin stirs the wrath of God. So Romans 1 in verse 18 now. For the wrath of God is revealed against heaven, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And then he begins a whole list of the sins of the Gentiles. God's wrath is stirred at sin. God's wrath is stirred at your sin and at my sin. Now with that in mind, we need to understand that when we sin, that sin is not a trivial matter. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Our God is a consuming fire. God's wrath has been stirred because of sin. And God's wrath was uh, displayed and destroyed such men as Nadab and Abihu, Dathan, Kor, and Abiram in number 16, Ananias and Sapphira. And so all of those passages, when we study, we say that's doom, that's destruction, and that's negative. I don't like the, the picture that gives. But what God wants us to see is that sin stirs the wrath of God. And it destroyed these people because God's wrath was stirred. All right? But we have a propitiation. Jesus is the propitiation for our sin. In other words, he's the appeasement of the wrath of God. How can I turn the wrath of God away from me? How can I turn the wrath of God away so that I'm not receptive of the wrath of God in judgment? We have a propitiation for our sin. We have an appeasement for sin. So let's go again to 1 John 2 and in verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. That appeasement is offered to every person on the face of the earth. So Jesus is said to be the propitiation for our sins. All right, let's look at another term that describes Jesus. And that is, he is said to be the life. He's the word, the propitiation. He is said to be the life. Now let's look at some passages that are going to tell us that. Let's go now to the Gospel of John, if you will. And let's go to John chapter 11. And notice in verse 25, John 11 and in verse 25. This is in the context of the raising of Lazarus. And notice at verse 25, Jesus said, I am the, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He said, I am the resurrection and I'm the life. He said to be the life. Whatever that means, he's the life. All right, here's another passage. Let's go to John 14. Let's go to John chapter 14 this time and in verse 6. This is in that discussion we looked at last week as we talked about Jesus talking to his disciples in his final discourse with his disciples. He said, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. That's three studies within itself. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. All I want you to see is he is said to be the life. Now, let's talk about what that means. That comes from a word, zoe. It's the word from which we get our word zoo or zoology. It gives the idea of life or life as a principle or the principle of life in the absolute sense, Vine says. In other words, it deals with life as opposed to death, Vincent argues. Now, life is sometimes used with reference to duration, like one's life. And so their life was 50 years or 80 years or 100 years. The duration of their life. It refers, though, to, the, to life as opposed to death, not the manner of your life or the duration of your life. In other words, it refers to physical life sometimes. It refers to spiritual life. It refers, refers to eternal life, depending on the context of that. But life as opposed to death. Now, here's what that means to us. Jesus is the source and the sustainer of life. Jesus is the source and the sustainer of life. He's the source and the sustainer of our physical life. Let's open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. And notice in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 16, this again is in that context of Jesus being preeminent in all things. And one of the things that makes him preeminent is he's the source of life. Through him, life itself was created. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominion or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. So everything that exists, man and animal and plant life, every one of those exists because of the work of Christ. He is the agent through whom God created those. So he is the source of our physical life. He's also the source of our spiritual life. Let's turn to Romans 10. And in verse 4, Romans chapter 10 and in verse 4, that for Christ is the end of the law for everyone who believes. You say, well, that's not about Christ bringing the end of the law of Moses. No, 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 it's not talking about that. That's not what the context is about. What he's saying, Christ is the aim of the law. The law was aiming toward men being righteous, and that righteousness is made available through Christ. That's his point, that spiritual life is made available through Christ. Well, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians 2, it opens with the scene that men are dead in sin. But those who are dead in sin are now made alive. You were made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. You were once dead and separated from God. Now notice verse 2, And once you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works now in the sons of disobedience, among whom once you conducted yourselves in lust, etc., now drop on down to verse 13. Verse 13 says, but now in Christ, you who once were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. He is the source of our spiritual life. He is the source of eternal life. He is the author of eternal salvation, Hebrews 5 and in verse 9, and to all them that obey him. So he's the source of our physical life, our spiritual life, and our eternal life. He is the source of life. So through Christ we have life. Let's go to John chapter 1 and in verse 4. Let's compound a few passages that make this point. Since this is a word study, let's see the, uh, several passages that emphasize that through Christ we have life. John 1 and verse 4 says, In him was life, and life was the light of men. So in him was life, the text says. We'll look at John 3 and in verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All that life comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to John chapter 4 and in verse 14. Jesus is, the, again, is life, and he is the, the, uh, the water, the living water, and he brings life through that living water. Now notice at verse 14. Whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him, he will become, will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You're going to drink of me and you're going to have everlasting life as a result. Well, let's go to John chapter 5. 
Go to the next chapter, chapter 5, if you will. And notice in chapter 5 and in verse 21, John 5 and in verse 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Again, he's the source of life. Let's go one more time, this time to John chapter John chapter 6. Go over a chapter to John chapter 6 and in verse 47. John 6 and in verse 47. Most assuredly I say to you, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. Now we won't take the time to trace these passages in Hebrews, but ultimately he has victory over death. That is, he raises the dead and he has victory over death. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we know he is, he is the word, he is the propitiation, he is the life, but he's also said to be our advocate, our advocate. So let's look at passages that deal with the fact that he is our advocate. Back to 1 John 2 and in verse 1. He is our advocate. That if I write unto you that you might not sin, John says, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The English word advocate is only used once. And it's used here in this context that Jesus is our advocate. However, the word that is translated advocate is used five times in the New Testament, but only one of those times is it used with reference to Christ. At other times, it refers to the Holy Spirit. So there's a sense in which he is like the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is like him. The same word is used. But what is the word and what does it mean? It comes from this word paraclete. It's the same word for comforter. Do you remember in John 14, John 15, John 16, those three texts? In those three chapters, Jesus said, I'm sending the comforter to you, talking about sending the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth who comes forth from the Father. He was called the comforter. It is this word paraclete, which is translated advocate. And so what does that mean? It's a compound word. The word literally means, para means to the side of, and the word kaleo means to summon or to call. So it literally means to call to the side of. It's the idea of a legal aid as we may think of a lawyer. If you got into legal trouble and you had legal problems, whether you're innocent or guilty, but you've got some legal problem, you call a lawyer to your side. You need an aid. You need someone to help you through the difficulty you're going through. So Jesus is said to be one that we call to our side. Now here's what Thayer says that means. He says it means summon or call to one side, especially call to one's aid. Calling someone to their side to aid them. One who pleads another's case before a judge, like we would think of as an attorney or lawyer, a pleader, a counselor for defense, a legal assistant, an advocate. Just as you may go into court and say, this is my advocate, or this is my counselor, or this is my attorney, this is my lawyer who's going to plead my cause for me, we have an advocate with the Father. We have someone who goes and pleads for us. Now, what does he do? What does the advocate do? Well, he pleads our case and our cause. There is a sense in which the Holy Spirit does that, but we're talking about Christ. He comforts and he consoles, Vincent says. He strengthens one's cause before the bar, Vincent argues. So as we stand before the bar of God, not talking about just the judgment day, but we're talking about as we appear before God, There is someone pleading our case and our cause. Someone who knows the circumstance. He's pleading for us. He is indeed our advocate. He convicts our adversary and pleads our case against God. Uh, Pleads our place before God. In other words, Vincent so argues. Now here's what I'm learning from that. That we're not left alone and defenseless when we sin. Now go back to 1 John 2 and in verse 1. He said, I'm writing unto you that you're not sin. In other words, you're not supposed to, and you're going to be in trouble if you do. But he said, if any man does sin, that doesn't mean it's okay, we have an advocate. In other words, you're not going to be left alone. So what does he do? Well, he intercedes for us. Now, that's his work as an intercessor, but that's part of his work as an advocate. He intercedes for us. Hebrews 7, he ever lives to make intercession for us. So when I sin before God, I'm not left to deal with this by myself. I have an advocate. I have someone 
comes to my side and pleads my cause. We see that both the Holy Spirit and the Son plead before God and intercede to us to God on our behalf. So we have one that's been called to our side. We have one that's come to our aid. So we don't have to be lost. God himself is working on our side. So it's not that I'm left, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, I don't know how to approach this, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this problem of sin. Someone has been called to my side, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Here's another expression that refers to Jesus. He is said to be the Lamb of God. He is said to be the Lamb of God. So let's look at John chapter 1 again. Let's go to John chapter 1, that is the Gospel of John. John, the first chapter, and notice in verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now drop down to verse 36. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So John uses that expression, he is the Lamb of God. Now let's turn to the book of Revelation. Now these are not the only passages that deal with this, but let's turn to Revelation chapter 5. You remember chapter 4 was the throne scene, and in chapter 5 we have the worthy lamb. God is on his throne and in control, chapter 4. Chapter 5 is the picture of the lamb of God that is worthy to open the scroll, all right? Now the lamb is mentioned more than just once, but I want you to look at verse 12 now. They sang and shouted and made this exclamation. Look, notice at verse 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Well, that obviously refers to Christ. He is the lamb that was slain. Well, that alludes to John's writings in John that we just noticed. He's the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, while we're in John, I want to leave Revelation, go back to John chapter 1. It's possible that John, when he said, behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, that is John the Baptist, when he saw that, that he may have been thinking of the Passover lamb. I don't know that he was, but it's possible. Because that was in John chapter 1, verse 29 and verse 36. The Passover is mentioned in chapter 2 and in verse 13. The Passover was coming up soon. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 7, Christ is said to be our Passover. So he is our Passover. And then that's one of the senses in which he is the Lamb of God. It indicates a sacrifice has been provided by God. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. This is one of those messianic sections that we'll come across in our studies of Isaiah. But notice Isaiah 53 and in verse 7. That he was oppressed, he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Speaking of the sacrifice he made for us. So him being called the Lamb of God, John may have been thinking about Jesus being the Passover lamb, and that would indicate indeed that he was the sacrifice that God had provided. In Acts chapter 8 and in verse 32, let's go to Acts chapter 8 and in verse 32, and we'll see the same principle a little bit later, but look, notice Acts 8 and verse uh, 32, that as the eunuch was reading from Isaiah 53, he came across the section that he was led as a lamb to, uh, as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shearers. And then notice at verse 35 that Philip began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So Jesus indeed is that lamb of God. He is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, it's used in different ways. Now what I mean by that, it's used sometimes, the expression the lamb of God, to emphasize the gentle and innocent character of Christ. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5. Now, all of these are talking about him being the sacrifice, but sometimes in the context, like in Revelation chapter 5, and I want you to notice beginning at verse 6, it seems to be used in the context of his innocent and gentle character. Notice at verse uh, Revelation chapter 5 and in verse 6, and be, and he looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood the lamb as though he had been slain. Here again is that innocent character. Drop down to verse, verse 12. We've already mentioned worthy is the lamb to be, uh, who was slain. Again, his innocent character seems to be emphasized. Let's go on to chapter, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 13. Go to Revelation chapter 13. 
And notice in verse 8, Revelation 13 and in verse 8, that all who dwell in the earth will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Again, it seems to emphasize his gentle and his innocent character, though the sacrifice is mentioned. But it's also used to describe him being indignant. That seems a little strange because normally we don't think of the lamb being indignant. But let's go to Revelation chapter 6, if you will. Let's go to the 6th chapter of the book of Revelation and notice in verse 16. And said to the mountain, and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Here the term Lamb is used in the context of the wrath being poured out. And so sometimes it's used in that sense and it's emphasizing that. Let's go to the 17th chapter of Revelation and there's the victory of the Lamb. So go to Revelation chapter 17 and in verse 14. And here is the victory. They will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So here's the victorious Lamb, kind of the, the summary of the book of Revelation, the victorious Lamb. So it's used in that sense. He is the object of adoration in the praise that was given of worthy is the Lamb, Revelation 5 and verse 8, and I'd add to that verse 12. They're singing praises. Around the throne, worthy is the Lamb. He's sitting on the throne, and worthy is the Lamb. So the idea of him being the one who is worthy, or one who is enthroned. We saw that in Revelation chapter 5, and in verse 13. He's sitting on his throne, and indeed, he is worthy. All right, let's look at one last phrase. Of words that describe Jesus, he is the only begotten Son. The text tells us he's the only begotten Son. Well, John chapter 1 and in verse 14. Go with me to John chapter 1. We'll see this in verse 14. You remember that he is the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now verse 14 connects with that. And the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Drop down four verses at verse 18. No, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has, uh, he has declared him. Are you familiar with John 3, 16? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So he is the only begotten of the Father. Let's turn to 1 John, if you will, chapter 4 and in verse 9. 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 9. One last passage on that point. He says at verse 9, and this is the love that God has manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. So John, in several places, mentions He is the only begotten Son. Now that comes from the word monogenes, which simply means literally only born. Mono meaning one, He's the only born. That may be an affirmation of the virgin birth. Some suggest that this is an illusion or a reference kind of a veiled reference to the virgin birth. And it may allude to that. But Vincent suggests, and so does Robertson and Kittle, they all agree, that it doesn't refer to his incarnation, but that it refers to his relationship to the Father as being unique. We are sons of God. We are children of God. We're all sons of God. And so Jesus is the Son of God, but there is a unique relationship to the Father. So let's go to the book of Colossians and again see that, that unique relationship to the Father. Look at Colossians 1 and in verse 15. This is in the context, again, of him being the preeminent Christ. One of the things that makes him preeminent is his unique relationship. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's not true of me and it's not true of you. Look at verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So he is preeminent in all things. He has a unique relationship with the Father. Robertson, A.T. Robertson says it refers to his eternal relationship, distinguishing the Father's relationship to Lagos from any believer. In other words, I'm a believer and so are you and so we're sons or children of God. But Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, has a unique relationship with to the Father. Now what does all of that mean to us? What that means is it's an affirmation of his deity. It's an affirmation of his deity. Go back to John 1 and verse 14. John 1 14 says, 
the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now that was in the context with verse 1, the Word was God. So it's used with reference to an affirmation of who He was. He's the only begotten of the Father. It's also used, and it means that He's able to give us the fullest eyewitness of God. No one has seen God at any time, John 1 verse 18. But the only begotten of the Father has, and He declares Him. So I have a full picture of what God the Father is like. How do I know what God the Father is like? Because the eyewitness to the Father, the one who has seen Him, has told us about Him and declared Him to us. So I have a full picture of the Father. I don't have to worry about what's the Father like? What's, what's His character like? I wonder what it's like to be around the Father. Jesus has told us. And furthermore, what it means is it means that there is the demand that men follow Him. Let's go back to John chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles open, let's go to John chapter 3 and notice in verse 16 and then we'll go to verse 18 and our lesson will be through. John 3 and in verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his only begotten, his only son, his only born that we should be believers in him. Look at verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you want to be condemned, then don't believe in the name of the only begotten. But if you want to be saved, then we must believe in the only begotten of the Father, the one full of grace and full of truth. Well, these are not the only words. Jesus is the word. He's the propitiation. He's the life. He's the advocate. He's the lamb. He's the only begotten. Time would fail us, but we could go on and talk about he's the door. There's a, he's called a door. He's called the bread. He's called the way. He's called the truth. And even then, that's just the beginning of the list of the words that describe Jesus. The Jesus that we love, the Jesus we serve, and the Jesus that we obey. Have you been obedient to Jesus who is the lamb, who is the life of the only begotten, the one who is the propitiation for your sins? If you're not a Christian, would you come tonight believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?